Location 8 will get kicked off. Okay, so welcome everybody to our Circular Economy webinar series. We're delighted you can join us here today. I'm Mary Cronin from Upvik, um, and I'll be with you for the next four weeks with my co-hosts, Kira Slevin from Climate Matters and Joanna Rook from Dublin City Council as our sponsors. We've had a fantastic domestic and international audience from Europe here today to Vietnam, across to, to Brazil, including cohorts, not only from business, but policymakers, academia and change makers. The purpose of our four part series is to create awareness and understanding of the circular economy. This is not only from an economic aspect, but from an environmental and social aspects. Each webinar will have business case studies um, and we'll explore the opportunities and the challenges and the benefits of circularity. Our conversations include domain experts and stakeholders to help you build knowledge, links and insights into how to unlock opportunities and the challenges that we have and the benefits of the circular economy. So to get us started, thanks to Dublin City Council, Eastern Midlands Waste Region, who are our sponsors today of the series. Uh, Joanne Rourke from Eastern Midlands Waste is going to say hello. Joanne. Hello, good evening everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the first webinar in our Modius Path Pathways to the Circular Economy webinar series. We have a great attendance this evening, with attendees from all over the globe, which is very exciting. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the Eastern Midlands Regional Waste Management Plan Office and supported by Dublin City Council Economic Development Office. These webinars involved a huge amount of work and research by Mary and Kira, and they're designed to complement our MODIS Circular Economy training program. We know that there's a broad audience for content and knowledge about the circular economy, and we want these webinars to really open up a multifaceted conversation about circular economy in Ireland and indeed beyond. Over the next four weeks, we have a fantastic lineup both speakers and topics for you. But for now, sit back, make yourself comfortable and enjoy the discussion and the insights from today's expert panelists. And I'll pass you back to Mary now. She's going to introduce you to those. Okay, thank, thank you, Mary. Joanne. Thank you, super, thank you. And so Sinead, just the agenda slide. Super. So. Just to introduce what we're going to do, our agenda for the next hour, Dr. Geraldine Brennan is going to talk to us about what is the circular economy. And we have CEO Peter Corcoran from Monaghan Mushrooms in Bio. And Patrick Barrett is going to talk to us from DAFM on the ecosystem and the stakeholders. And we will have a rapid question after each presenter. And at the end, we'll have questions and answers. Our hashtags, if you're following us on Twitter, um, are there on the screen and we have a number of Twitter handles also um, if you would like to, to, to follow us. So to get started then, um, next slide, Sinead. So our presenters, Geraldine, Peter and Patrick, and to get started to introduce Geraldine, Dr. Geraldine Brennan. Geraldine's a leading expert in the circular economy. She spent the last decade exploring the barriers and enablers of industry adoption and the implementation of circular and sustainable business models, really what we're talking about over the next four weeks. Geraldine's working as the lead program manager with the Irish Manufacturing Research, delivering IMR's flagship circular economy initiative, Circulaire. Geraldine. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today uh, and welcome to everyone from across Ireland and further afield. It's great to see so much enthusiasm, enthusiasm and excitement for the circular economy gaining traction not only in Ireland, but further afield. Uh, next slide, please. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm just gonna give you a whistle stop tour. Oh, hang on a sec. <laughs> if you could just bear with me um, on what is the circular economy. So effectively it's about shifting away from the take make waste linear economy where there's extraction production uh, and ultimately use of products which then end up disposed of as opposed to ultimately keeping them in use in the economy for longer. So the circular economy and circular economy business models is ultimately about trying to introduce feedback loops 
into value chains and value networks that enable reuse and the circulation of re resources, retaining their economic value, preserving the embedded emissions and eliminating waste. Apologies if there's a little bit of background noise. Um, it's just the nature of beast working from home in, in light of COVID and it's somewhat beyond my, my, my control. Ultimately, my key message with the little graphic that's gonna come up, if you could just click the next build for me, is ultimately the circular economy is a systemic um, approach. It is much more than just reduce, reuse, recycle. Reducing um, uh, use of materials is really important, as is reuse, as is recycling. But the circular economy is about fundamentally all of the different range of strategies like repair, refurbishment, remanufacturing, repurposing, cascades, valorization, the sharing economy that ultimately keep materials, components, and goods in use. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit of context around Ireland. So ultimately the EPA estimate that we are spending over 10 million tons of materials annually in the economy. Back in 2013, a funded study uh, estimated that just a 5% material improvement could yield over 2 billion euro per annum for, the, for Irish industry. A follow-up study, next point please. Was that this hasn't been addressed. And ultimately that's behind the motivation to create circular, which was established last year. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of what are the opportunities, what are the benefits, what's the business case for the circular economy? There are a number of key benefits from a macroeconomic level. It's about economic growth and resource cost savings, job creation, innovation, Environmentally, it's fundamentally about decarbonization. Circularity and the low carbon net zero economy go hand in hand. When it comes to social benefits, again, when with regards to job creation, retention, it's not just the fact that we can create new jobs, it's the fact that turning waste into a resource where it's created and disrupting supply chains in a, in a positive way because we're creating secondary raw material markets allows for more localized job creation and regional job creation. When it comes to businesses, SMEs and, and larger organizations alike, it's about resilience to resource price volatility and supply chain shocks like those we've witnessed and continue to witness in light of our navigating of, of COVID. It's also about new revenue models and new value creation opportunities, diversification into, into new ways of working with our supply chains, as well as new relationships with our customers, because we're effectively shifting away from single point transactions. Next slide, please. When it comes to opportunities, the, the eight sectors you see there from agri-food to pharma to ICT, plastics, textiles, furniture, packaging, construction are all outlined in the European Circular Economy Action Plan 2.0. Uh, there are significant opportunities across all of these sectors across Europe, in particular for Ireland, agri-food, pharmaceuticals, um, construction, retail, food services have been identified as this, the highest resource productivity opportunity areas. Next slide, please. When it comes to some of the challenges that businesses need to be mindful of as they go on this journey to transform towards circularity, is that it's, it's worth bearing in mind that material purity and volume of uh, recovered materials is key in order to fundamentally substitute for um, other perhaps linear or, or um, virgin uh, raw materials. Another key consideration is do you have do you need to set up an enabling infrastructure, be that a physical reverse logistics uh, network, be it other things like digital infrastructure? Do you need to understand and take advantage of things like blockchain, uh, the industrial internet of things in order to enable you to, uh, to aggregate not only waste and at the material level, but ultimately understand what state your products or components are in, be they with clients or on their way back to you. And this is where data comes in. Ultimately, information is key to enabling recovery for reuse and recycling. So the advent of material passports and digital passports is a key enabler of this transformation. Specifically, when it comes to uh, Ireland, there is, and things like industrial symbiosis, there is a need for um, 
I guess, clarity around certain end of waste byproduct decisions. This can be a challenging area for some businesses. And there are opportunities to learn for other European countries where certain materials or, or byproducts and residues are already being used and they've been proven safe to do so. When it comes to policy, policy coherence is really important. Uh, Ireland has gone on a huge journey over the last number of years, and it's an exciting time in this space. I think one of the things that, that gives me um, most hope and excitement is the establishment of the circular economy units in the last couple of months. And I think it's important for businesses to uh, be mindful and be aware of some of the, the policy that's coming along and feed into the consultations. There's a, a new consultation coming out soon on the all of government uh, circular economy strategy. Next slide, please. And fundamentally, uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what Circular does in terms of our, what we see as important to uh, supporting businesses from startups to SMEs to multinationals to capture circular advantage, like uh, the work the Dublin City Council, Upthink, uh, and Modus, et cetera, are doing, it's really important to raise awareness and, and increase understanding of the circular economy. And I just want to point out that we have um, on our website one of the largest open access knowledge repositories for circular economy case studies in, in Ireland. Knowledge sharing is so important through mechanisms like this. We also run thematic working groups. Last year, we focused on circular bioeconomy, industrial symbiosis, circular procurement. There's lots of opportunities to engage. Capacity building. Um, we also have an innovation fund where we do uh, fund circular systems innovations. We fund new ventures. And ultimately, it's about collaboration and complementarity. There is so much work to do in this space. Uh, thank you again for your time. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Geraldine, for taking us on that journey. Uh, many of our attendees today, and we've over 200, I can see, logged in. Many are from SMEs in the target sectors you've mentioned, agri-food, pharma, plastics, packaging. What advice would you give them on moving from linear to circular business models? That's a really good question, Sarah. And I think that's one of the things that's so important about uh, webinars like this and, and others is to acknowledge that the transition is not always straightforward and that understanding where to start is important. One of the biggest things I can say is you need to understand and measure where you are now. You need to understand what is your current impact. Uh, and effectively, you need to take stock around where, you know, you might be already implementing a circularity strategy before you start horizon scanning through your business or your perhaps into your supply chain to see where are the opportunities to collaborate others to transform a waste or extend the life of a, 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 a component or product. Ultimately, uh, in addition to that, some of the things that can be useful is to, to map the flows of your material, water and energy through your own business and, and parts of your supply chain. And then try and develop an idea of where you want to go. Um, I, we recommend that you, you think about what are your objectives? You know, where, where do you want to be? And, and, and know that it is a journey and ultimately understand what you could do um, to begin with to get yourself headed in the right direction. Thank you very much, Geraldine. There's many more questions coming in, um, but we better uh, move on. And if we've time, we'll come to some more at the end. So next speaker I'd like to introduce is Peter Corkin. Um, Peter is the CEO with Monaghan Biosciences Limited, or MBio. And Peter's going to talk to us today on the journey um, that the mushroom industry around Monaghan has taken over the last while. Thank, Thank you, Peter. You, Thank you, Kira. Thanks, Peter. Um, and maybe before um, Peter starts, if you'd like to put a question into the Q&A, uh, certainly put it in and we can pick them up at the end. Great. Thank you, Kira. Thanks, Peter. OK, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Kira. Um, I'll start on the next slide. That's great. So uh, I guess I, I lead the MBio team, which is the innovation arm of Monaghan Mushrooms, just by way of background. Um, but the material that we work with truly is um, almost the best expression of the bioeconomy. And it is the mushroom, because what the mushroom does is essentially it breaks down organic matter, returning the nutrients of um, life back into the soils. Um, it is part of uh, nature's natural recycling process. And it is that that Monaghan Mushrooms focuses on. So. It's got a bit of an advantage in that it is starting with such a, a wonderful uh, 
base raw material. So in terms of the origin, I'll just give one slide by way of background. So Ronnie Wilson, Wilson pictured here, started the business around 40 years ago. Um, he is without question a mushroom evangelist. Um, he believes that we are entering a, a new age, which will be defined by an increasing awareness of the mushroom and indeed of the benefits that the mushroom will bring to our lives. Um, he's built and developed a business that holds sustainability as key. And indeed the nature of um, the mushroom industry generally and also internationally is that it is firmly anchored in rural communities, which is I think one of the benefits and principles that benefit bioeconomy based businesses. So I'm going to talk about a number of features of how the principle of bioeconomy finds expression within Monaghan um, to see if that uh, generates some thoughts or, or ideas for other participants or people listening in on the uh, briefing today. So the first, the first piece that I'll speak about is, is the subject of end of cycle materials. And I think it's a, it's a very, very good starting point to look at. So consider whether the raw material flows coming into your business can indeed be replaced by other end of cycle material providers. And equally at the back end, consider your own end of cycle materials and consider whether or not you can create higher value expression from those. Again, the mushroom is, is, is um, definitely positioning Monaghan in a very advantageous position in that the entry point for what Monaghan does indeed are end of cycle materials. You've got essentially um, straw and chicken litter, which are end of cycle materials from other processes. The second theme that I probably would call out is the subject of vertical integration. Because to find um, good solutions to bioeconomy based problems, you typically need to trace through your material flows. And that will require sometimes a connection with your precursor or your following step in, in your supply chain. Again, Monaghan benefits from being vertically integrated. We full trace back right the way to straw and chicken litter, all the way through to the mushrooms that land on the retail stores. So I think this subject of vertical integration, again, is a beneficial feature of what Monaghan does and how it operates. But it is a second area which I would encourage you to consider when you're trying to find a focus on areas to improve, let's say, your footprint from a bioeconomy uh, perspective. The third, the third theme is, is uh, a feature which Monaghan invests quite heavily in, and that is the, the feature of pre precision farming, preci precision agriculture. Um, this is a theme is, is reported on um, in, in really extensive literature, but it's spoken about uh, from the perspective of ag tech. Um, the reality is, is that there are numerous businesses in the food and agricultural business that are deploying technologies that are precision farming in nature. M uh, mushroom production definitely does that. Um, but if I think about berry production, there's hydroponics deployed extensively in the production of berries. Netherlands are characterized as being one of the most efficient producers of uh, food and food um, in particular um, uh, for, for example, tomatoes or other forms. But looking within Monaghan, what does that mean? So precision mar farming within the Monaghan system means essentially that every component is standardized. Every uh, variable associated with encouraging the mycelia to translate into its spore forming stage, which ultimately results in the growth of mushrooms, is systematically controlled, whether it's the oxygen flows, carbon dioxide, uh, water. 
these are features which lend itself to a highly efficient consumption of inbound raw materials and I think is characteristic of quite a number of businesses but certainly is an element that a lot of focus is placed on. The next two elements um, I think are connected um, and that is Ronnie certainly from an early uh, early stage in the development of the business sought really to analytically deconstruct and understand the whole end-to-end -end cycle of mushroom growing and development. That is definitely being enabled by science and biotechnology with a concentration into the last five to 10 year period. Um, under Ronnie's guidance, they have mapped the full life cycle of organisms and life through the composting and mushroom growing stage. And then we understand the components of that that contribute towards the production of mushrooms. And I think that that knowledge gives Monaghan the ability to understand the levers and triggers that can naturally be encouraged to produce higher quality and possibly higher yielding mushrooms for the market. And then the last piece of the jigsaw is that again, science and this understanding allows you to get under the bonnet. And getting under the bonnet for me means understanding what is in your end product and considering can you create higher value products from your base raw material. But secondly, reconnecting into that starting point and looking at your own end of cycle materials and asking the question of whether you can valorize those and create this next loop. And um, on the next slide, I'm going to describe some of the higher value products that we have created. But before I do so, I just want to talk about this little circle in the left hand corner. Um, and that is, we have been highly collaborative in the journey over the last five to 10 years. I've privileged only to have joined the business a little over two and a half years ago. But when I joined, Monaghan was already part of two large Horizon 2020 programs, her fungus chain and biorescue. And it is connected into a much wider network of academic and other industry-based partnerships, which allow us to glean information and knowledge and indeed share information back. And maybe the best expression of that, we hope, will be the creation of a biotechnology research center locally in Monaghan called BioConnect. And we're one of the founding partners in making that happen. So in this, and this next slide is really, well, how does, this, how does the expression from a higher value product express? So on the top line, we have nutrient enriched mushrooms, whether it's a, a vitamin D, a B12, a B6, a selenium. Each of these products are all focused on identified health needs discussed and agreed with the retailers. In the second line, we've got a range of nutrient enriched powders where we're taking the fresh mushroom and we're turning it into a food ingredient, a beverage ingredient, or indeed they're at such high levels of concentration, we can take them directly into nutraceutical applications. And then the final line is going up a level where we're currently in the process of preparing to launch a range of meat-free products with over 70% mushroom content. So it's really starting with the base product and through, I guess, our, our research and development, we're creating higher value applications from either the base raw material or derivatives thereof. So, so one of the questions that I was asked to address is, you know, what challenges do you see? Um, and, and I've tried to frame this a little bit from the perspective of maybe businesses that are entering this topic from an earlier stage of development. Like I say, I've joined MBio about two and a half years ago, but the reality is, is that Ronnie was really driving the agenda on this subject well over five years preceding. So I think, I think one of the big questions is, is how do you take the first step? Um, and I think you have to get out and connect into networks. You absolutely have to get in. So whether it's, you know, Patrick Barrett will be speaking next or whether it's um, 
the IMR. There are a whole range of networks out there, such as IRDG, that I think you have to connect into to learn from what other businesses are doing. I think secondly, relating to this connection is do not be solely focused on an Irish perspective. You know, state of the art may well exist in other jurisdictions. Steps that you think or you're taking that are unique may have been taken five years ago. So I think in learning that state of the art, do not take a binary view in your own country. Look beyond, find the true state of the art and learn and push it, okay? The second is, is that while we've been very lucky to be part of two very large um, Horizon 2020 programs, and indeed the Horizon Europe program now has just begun, and um, I, I believe the bioeconomy is absolutely going to be central to quite a number of the, of the calls uh, over the next decade. The reality is, is that these programs are big, um, success rates are low, and timelines are long. So if I was anchoring an R&D cycle or an MPD cycle contingent on a big Horizon 2020 win or Horizon Europe win, I definitely would want to hedge my bets. And secondly, I would want to get appropriate advice on how to get a win there. I think stumbling into a consortium that generates a win in this area is unlikely. That said and done, if you have a unique access to a raw material or a unique processing capability, you may be very attractive to a large entity driving one of these large programs. So a degree of caution in that regard. Um, failure, it's a, it's a cliche. It is absolutely part of the innovation process, but if you don't invest, you're not gonna get ahead. And I think the last one is possibly an infrastructure gap from an Irish perspective. I think the path to support R&D is clear. However, I believe the scale-up stage of a business's growth is inadequately supported in an Irish context. There is a major gap in support because if you're scaling infrastructure, which typically is a key element of the bioeconomy, the support level for this is very, very poorly serviced. And I think it only amplifies risk. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Peter, for that. And you've actually covered quite a number of the um, questions um, on your last slide, the benefits of collaboration and integration, both at home and abroad. Uh, a very brief one, um, Monaghan Mushrooms 2030, what does that look like? Health, Kira. Health, uh, absolutely yeah. health. We, we want to get the best out of the mushroom and it is fundamentally centered on the theme of health. Okay. I, if Monhan ends up stretching into the area of pharmaceuticals, who, yeah. who knows where the future is, but it is fundamentally anchored on the direction of health and well-being. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'd thank now you, like Kate. to introduce um, Patrick Barrett from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. As Mary mentioned, Patrick has been a key influencer in building the bioeconomy with Ireland, and we're delighted to have him here today. And many, many people will already know Patrick, given all the effort and time he has spent um, with this sector, which is really coming to fruition now. So over to you, Patrick. Thanks very much, Kira, and thanks very much to the team. And uh, good afternoon to everyone that's that's tuned in. I hope you're all safe and well. So listen, I'll try and kick off and and, my, uh, and, and zip through. What I want to say, the steps to taking a, a path on, on your journey into the bioeconomy and, and, and the circular bioeconomy, and really what is the bioeconomy. So I suppose broadly, uh, as uh, Geraldine has very uh, neatly laid out about the circular economy, trying to design out waste and keep products and materials in use and regenerate natural systems. And I suppose the circular bioeconomy tries to put some meat on the bone on that in terms of what it means in terms of bio, uh, biological materials. So in Ireland, very much what it means, it means aligning with our colleagues who are looking for natural capital approaches for uses of our land and marine systems and the resources that are there. It's about redesigning uh, the bio-based economy. And what do we mean there? Well, we're going from agriculture, forestry, we're going through fisheries and aquaculture into what those, how those materials are used when they're uh, processed for food and feed and 
uh, sometimes uh, uh, chemicals, sometimes materials, sometimes uh, bioenergy, sometimes biofuels. But it's the, the, the real thing about biological resources, if you consider it, is it's a, it has fascinating features, such as you can cascade the use of, of this material. It's also renewable if it's managed properly, and it can be carbon neutral again if it's ma managed properly, and it can, have, it can have wonderful properties, either be it for health and nutrition, as Peter has outlined, or it could be in terms of how it can function uh, for, uh, in, in the farmer world or how it can function as a nutrient. So part of the bioeconomy is that we wish to replace non-renewables with biological resources, but really, if we were to think about that, we have to be quite judicious. It, it could displace materials in construction or packaging or textiles or pharmaceuticals. But if we were to just replace it one for one, well, then we probably need multiple times of the world. So it's where can bio resources go to where they are most needed and where we ensure food and nutrition security is, is, uh, is provided. So that's a general outline. Maybe if I could go on to the next slide, then I'm going to zip through the, the, the rest of it. So when we're trying to explain the bioeconomy to uh, uh, pe people who are very interested in this area, we do things like trying to get people in tune with the types of terminology. So I'm not going to go into detail in this, but I just wanted to say that resources like this that we've developed with the National Rural Network are here in place to highlight who are the groups you should talk to and what are the terms that are used by the by the people who are op operating in the bioeconomy and to help you then once you understand the terms to be on a, a level playing field to, to speak with them. So the next slide, please. So really the big picture that I want to paint for you is the trajectory where the bioeconomy is playing a role. And really you can see this represented in the EU Green Deal, which is all about trying to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. And I'm not going to go into the details, as I said here, but you can see that the bioeconomy contrib contributes in many different ways to the European Green Deal. And mainly this has been driven through the EU bioeconomy strategy, which is put in place and has led to many European countries putting a strategy in place themselves. But if you look at the, the sort of implementation actions of the EU Green Deal on methane, on biodiversity, on circular economy, on farm to fork, you will see bioeconomy in there as a cross-cutting element in all of those documents. And there's more chemicals and, and other areas as well. So just, just, just to let you know, the bioeconomy is well integrated now into the, into the policy sphere. So it's all about now moving to a phase of implementation. And that's what I want to move on to next, uh, please. So just to say, I'm going to go through a number of steps here, just to say what we're doing in Ireland. And just to say, this will highlight places where it will allow engagement by the maybe some of the community that's in, in, involved today. Um, sorry, I got knocked off my computer. Uh, so the first step we want to highlight is that there's a national policy statement in place. And one of the big main things that uh, uh, industry and SMEs and, and people who wish to participate in an economic activity look for policy stability. And that's what this statement is supposed to be driving towards. One of the first steps that has been put in place is that there's a cross-government high-level implementation group working on a whole uh, range of different actions as highlighted here. And that's on a regular basis reporting into government and on a regular basis trying to engage with all the different stakeholders in the Bioeconomy Ireland, such as through events like Bioeconomy Ireland Week. And you can see there uh, Minister Martin Hayden in the, in the photograph for an event during Bioeconomy Ireland Week at the launch. And that just shows you like the political backing that also the policy is now receiving. So if I could uh, go on to my next step, please. So one of the things that we're really, that's really critical for policy development is to make a place where uh, key industries and key actors such as primary producers or technology developers or different uh, uh, researchers or uh, scientific or, uh, groups, they need to inform government about what is required for bioeconomy development. We, we saw Peter highlighting there, maybe there's uh, gaps in the sort of scaling up uh, funding opportunities that might, might be available. This type of detail is needed. It's need, the government needs to be informed about what it needs to do by the stakeholders on the ground who are trying to implement actions. So there will be a bioeconomy forum which will be uh, launched in the next uh, 
I suppose, number, uh, maybe one or two months, um, a work program has been developed at the moment. So keep your eyes open for that space. Uh, we'll be looking for engagement. Again, just to say like that in the sort of long-term uh, outlook by the government, bioeconomy is well placed within the, uh, the national policy objectives in terms of Project Ireland 2040. The point being there, if it's, if it's highlighted as a policy objective, then that's a, a commitment by the government and the, the, to not only uh, have something in place that withstands one government, but should be in place for a number of governments and the uh, funding and opportunities should follow. So if we could just follow on now to the, the next uh, steps that I want to highlight. Again, as Peter highlighted, for industry, for SMEs, for people who are willing to engage in the bioeconomy, it's very important that they establish and maintain collaborative partnerships and build up their networks. And this has meant that a number of different opportunities, the Bioeconomy Research Centre, BioOrbic, Circle Era, very critical uh, organisation, as Geraldine has pointed out today, but other groups, as Peter has pointed out, BioConnect, Irish Nutrient Sustainability Fat Platform, Irish Bioeconomy Foundation, the Circular Bioeconomy, Southwest Cluster. These are all in place as a point of engagement and as a point of expertise that you can engage in to try and help you understand what's your biomass resource, what technologies could be applicable, what products could you develop, what, what market opportunities are out there, and putting all this together into a package. Of course, access to and cost of capital is absolutely critical. But in this space, what we're seeing is very high interest uh, through the development of several different funds, either through the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, which has come into play since October uh, 2020, the role of the Irish Strategic Investment Fund and its interest in the circular bio, uh, bioeconomy and circular economy, and then other funds that are being launched throughout the world developing around circular bioeconomy. So what we are seeing is flows of private capital uh, being uh, provided alongside, uh, uh, I suppose, science and technology opportunities. And this is all in an effort to try and scale up and get products uh, to the market and get markets developed. If I could move on then just to the final few uh, points, I suppose what I want to really point out here is just to say there are research and innovation projects that could be of interest to you. They could be in terms of plastics, they could be in terms of developing the circular bioeconomy in regional areas, they could be in terms of uh, alternative proteins, they could be in terms of biopesticides or biofertilizers. They could be in terms of uh, realizing the funding opportunities that allow for example, projects scale up through demonstration levels and technology readiness levels, where you can uh, assess the techno-economic feasibility of what you're trying to do, allow you to engage with networks and bring your, uh, bring your activities, your products, your technologies, your, your processing to fruition and to, uh, as I suppose, a high level of, of pre-commercialization. And what we can see is a number of companies working their way through this. And these are, I suppose, concrete examples in the Irish system that you could speak to these companies and see what resources they rely on, see what technologies they're developing, what products are developing, where did they get their sources of finance? But the key thing is with the bioeconomy that's, that's really interesting from, for example, uh, the Department of Agriculture point of view, is all these companies are turning up in loads of different rural and regional areas. And that's really important for uh, prosperity, jobs and competitiveness outside of the major urban areas. So if we could just move on then, um, coming to the end. Of course, there are large resources in the system that you can tap into. There are large state agencies uh, that uh, have a lot of uh, really high capacity people that you could engage with. Sometimes they have funding opportunities, but these will all help you work your way through either science and technology development or exploring regulatory matters or looking or examining uh, market development. And, and these, 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 uh, these um, uh, agencies are in place to help you do that. The one thing that Peter mentioned is, it's not always about developing a technology from a low TRL right through. We need to be able to and it be, have interest to explore internationally what's going on. And Ireland through the EU uh, opportunity can reach out across many different member states and bring back in uh, really interesting information. So we see now 
uh, for, as an example, like Carberry, the, the, the dairy company, working very closely with, uh, with Irish researchers who are working very closely with Danish and Netherlands researchers to see what products can be created from grass. And it's not just a feed for animals. It can be uh, something that produces chemicals, something that produces nutrients and a whole range of products. So the farmer could be sitting on a much more valuable material than they even thought they had before this. And one that can be produced to uh, help to make the, the dairy system carbon neutral and achieve ma a, a many of the, the, the key challenges it, it faces. So just coming right to the end there now um, with the last slide. The one thing that we want to say about the bioeconomy as well is that oftentimes it's not just about science and technology, but it's about people and it's about companies. And we really need to be able to understand that a bioeconomy and, and not this opportunity and a circular economy needs to be able to uh, understand the societal context and it needs to be under it needs to understand how you need to work how different products need to be considered by the consumer or how they need uh, farmers need to change their practices and this is something that for example the bioeconomy research center is working on so it shows you the multi sort of policy approach that's required and again just to come back just to to to, to, to come to the final point just to say on international collaboration in terms of the bioeconomy, there is actually a specific public-private partnership in place, which offers the opportunities for SMEs and industries to engage in the writing of a research program. So you could find the topic that you specifically want on a research program. You, you have to competitively apply for it, but nonetheless, it highlights how the policy system is trying to reach back into the innovation sphere and trying to tempt industry to step forward and to probably give some time and resources to kind of develop the opportunities. Comes at a, it comes at a cost, it doesn't come for free, but nonetheless, it may be the right opportunity for you. So thanks very much, uh, Mary and the team. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That was, that was really great. And Patrick, I suppose we've worked together over a couple of years now and you're a real influencer and facilitator um, of the whole bioeconomy and advocate of the circular bioeconomy. So, so that's some great work being done there. And I guess um, what you've alluded to over your slides is in or around, I love that, that part you talk about the collaborative partnerships and the networks that you've been looking to build up. And, you know, lots of examples you've given and Peter and Jerlene have talked about this as well, about tapping into the partnerships and tapping into um, the networks that are out there. Um, and, you know, there's Bioorbig and there's the Irish Bioeconomy Foundation and, and indeed even the regional um, the regional hubs that are that are being set up or clusters, even like the, the one in Kerry now with Helena McMahon and Katrina um, on the, uh, the Southwest cluster. But I guess the question really is, what do you see as the main opportunities for Ireland um, post post COVID for companies? So I suppose, Mary, the, the opportunity arises to address some of the key challenges. So the agri-food sector faces significant challenges in terms of sustainability. Mm. Um, we have to uh, be able to underpin the agri-food sector with uh, appropriate management of the water resources, biodiversity, uh, yes. our impact on, the cli on climate. Mm. Um, but aligned with addressing that, we need to be able to find opportunities, I suppose, that also addresses key uh, economic challenges that primary producers mm -hmm. face. And also, I suppose, trying to future-proof our uh, food processing industry. And yeah. again, to try and align all those opportunities, um, I suppose that's what has kind of piqued my interest in, in the circular bioeconomy in that it tries to address a multiplicity of, um, of, 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 of these areas. And again, like as, 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 uh, as Peter would have pointed out, on top of that, you have the whole uh, outlook on, on health and nutrition and you have to be able to combine and deal with all those matters. And you have to be able to yes. build up business models and value chains that can, can help you address that. And that's where, that's where we play a role in trying to uh, link people into uh, key thinkers in this area and um, yes, then yes. we all work together to try and solve these what seem like uh, yes. interminable challenges but nonetheless they have to yes. be solved. 
But I guess I guess there's a lot there, even from an ecosystem aspect. You know, there's terminology and there's people coming coming together and and, and different different stakeholders as well. There's a lot of questions coming in on the uh, questions and answers. I'm just going to pick up one or two of them, and then I might work back to Peter and to um, Geraldine. So one, Patrick, is in around anaerobic digestion. I know we've had we've had discussions around this, and we have um, Green Generation on next week talking about this as well. So is anaerobic digestion going to be supported? It, like in the UK, for example, in sense that um, in the UK, diverting away from fossil fuels. So I think people are probably aware of the references to anaerobic digestion in the Climate Action Plan. And maybe more recently, they will be uh, aware of references to, to AD in the Ag Climatized, the Department of Agriculture, uh, I suppose, uh, working plan. And so there's still elements that need to be worked out in terms of anaerobic digestion. And they are, there's no clarity at the moment on those from a policy perspective. And I suppose mm -hmm. that's what investors are looking for at the moment. But mm -hmm. I suppose we have some more clarity from the EU methane strategy where it's saying that developments in terms of biogas and AD uh, will look to um, rely on residues from 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 uh, biological re resources and their processing. So we've clarity what what the resources are to use. Uh, the technology is stable, and I suppose what we're looking for is is the sort of what what is the what is the market supports that may go along with this. But the the, the story hasn't been hasn't been unfolded in Ireland yet. So uh, mm -hmm. I think we, I think the, the opportunity will open for people to engage in the consultative process yes. quite soon. Mm -hmm. and that could be the I point. think so too, and I think. We're definitely moving in that direction though, aren't we? Um, great, thank you, Patrick. So what might I do now, we might open up some, some questions um, and maybe back to Peter. Uh, so a number of questions are coming in, Peter um, and, and uh, Geraldine. Um, but maybe back to Peter, uh, what you talked about in around your whole scale up um, and, and scaling up and it can, it can be a challenge. So one of the questions here, so scaling up is very, is a, a known challenge for many new technologies and green infrastructure. Um, in Peter's view, what are the gaps and what can be done to support Ireland when scaling up? Yeah. Um, well, you know, at, at the moment we're in the process of two scale ups in terms of a new MPD lines that, that we're bringing, we're bringing, uh, bringing online. And, um, I guess my perspective on this is twofold. Um, one is, is if the appropriate infrastructure was there to support scale-up trials, uh, we, we would have used it. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's partially there, but some of the areas that we're working on are quite specific. So it's not always possible. Um, but I think greater access to scale-up infrastructure would be, would be very valuable. Now there is some very good infrastructure deployed, for example, in Chagas facilities, whether it's uh, the food facility in Ashtown or the um, the facility uh, further south, where the um, a lot of the dairy processing technology capability is mm. there. Mm. Um, I think that's one feature. So collectively, can you access scale up infrastructure that can perhaps de-risk the next step? But fundamentally, when you make a scale up, you're still testing the market. And um, through that process of scaling up, you're going to experience challenges, trials and problems, which mm. you then have to process solve. So for me, a big issue here is, is actually the support through that stage. It's almost like collectively Ireland views that we'll double down on support for R&D but once you come out of that R&D phase, maybe TRL four or five, and you're starting mm. to put your first footprint assets into, mm. into the soil to allow you to produce your products at that first, that risk is almost greater <laughs> because you're yeah. having to put yeah. the capital in before you validated the market, mm. you know? Um, so for me, that's the one that really personally hurts at the moment because we're yes. putting the capital in and we still know there's market risk associated. Now, we, we hope we've done all our homework right and, and that we will address that. Yes. But I think that's a reality for any business going through this step. And I think there is a deficit of support there. 
Yes, yes, very good. And I guess the piece around as well, Peter, around, um, you might be alluding to this in the question is, uh, the access to finance you know we know a lot of investors and private yeah. investors are investing in tech um yeah unlike north america and canada where they are investing in the bioeconomy in the circular economy much more and it's really that yeah. part around more capital uh at a greater higher capital uh, much faster with less less red tape really so it's it's kind of a european piece really that uh, yeah. europeans aren't investing in the circular economy or the bioeconomy as much as north america but we're moving in that direction would you have a would you have a comment to make on that as regards and finance yeah. recovering on the third set, um webinar yeah, but... I, I guess i guess i'm in, i'm in a different business now to where I've come from before but but I do come from a business that was very finance hungry it was renewable energy and I think the protective piece around that is is actually you know really having created something of tremendous value so creating a state-of-the-art position you know mm. um because it is that that, for example, the early stage of the venture funds are looking for. They're looking for something that is explosively repeatable into multiple jurisdictions. So do you have a, te a technology capability? I think the other piece is something that does allude to the theme of bioeconomy, which is your, which is that theme of consortium or network. Because one of the big validators for an investment proposal is to have that connection into a larger player. So if there is a, a, an SME looking to raise finance, but you have already created that connection, for example, into an element of your supply chain that is of a much larger beast, <laughs> a larger business, mm -hmm. that can lend credibility through to you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm, I've probably seen things yeah. from slightly different lens now because yeah, I'm no. an organization that does its own you know, it's, it's got a, it's got a team that are focused on that separately. Yeah. Really good insights. That's really good. Maybe one last question before we move on to Geraldine. Um, I'll take it from the chat box this time. So uh, on the technology front, so what are the role of digital technologies and the transition towards the circular economies? Can you share an example? So you've alluded to in yeah. your presentation around, you know, technologies, and we know that really we have to combine what we're doing with yeah. technologies to move forward. Yeah. I, I um, uh, increasingly we're seeing data as a huge as a huge role to play here. Um, yes. Uh, and again, it's right from the right from the top of the business. You know, Monaghan yes. have an aspiration to set the industry standard for Industry 4.0 of the mushroom industry, and they're going to get there. And I know that fundamentally, data analysis and data capability is fundamental to yeah. that. So I, I do see, <laughs> I do see a large uh, focus on this area. So it's, it's not a case yes. that I see the theme of bioeconomy as being exclusively a process solution or an engineering solution. There is yes. a lot of focus on the subject of data because data is going to give you the information to understand whether mm -hmm. your process changes are being validated. Um, so yes. I, I think it has, it has a huge it has a huge role to play. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, for sure. And really leveraging that scale as well um mm. internationally mm. great peter thank you, thank you. so geraldine um over to you then maybe for a moment uh, great presentation geraldine and and you talked a lot about um the whole even the design stage and you're doing a huge amount with with circular around um around developing smes and developing companies so just a question here now it's a bit of a long question but let me summarize it so design for circularity is key to circular economies um, success manufacturing in the bioeconomy. However, natural systems processes have valuable byproducts. However, how do these byproducts, how are they used? They must be sustainable if they contribute to the linear economy and the waste generated from used as a secondary raw material. How is this being tested in projects? And could we get some examples? So I guess it's, I guess that question is alluding to two, there are, you know, valuable byproducts byproducts how do you test some of those maybe Geraldine do you have a comment along that theme I was, just busy, I was just busy crafting a response in the chats uh, it's a really valuable um, 
question and, and query and kind of health yes. warning. And I use health warning in the, there are no silver bullets. You know, there are arguments around we could, if we're not mindful and careful about how we make choices around um, implementing circular strategies, end up with a throwaway circular economy, meaning we just emphasis the pace of flows through the economy and yes. don't look at the negative externalities and look at stocks as well as flows in the economy. So when it comes to the biological nutrients or biological flows, absolutely, I think you can't ignore the ultimate end of life of anything. Yes. And you do need to take a life cycle perspective yes. and be honest about the pros and cons of the different solution spaces that are in front of you. Um, I, I don't have an example specifically of where this is, and maybe Patrick, you might have some where this is really emphasized. I could see you were also typing, uh, but <laughs> I think there's a recognition in the circular bioeconomy that ultimately it's not circularity at all costs. There's always questions with regards to your investment, yes. be it capital, be it labor, be it more materials, be it energy. Ultimately, there's always considerations and uh, the ultimate impact has to be beneficial. Otherwise, perhaps it's not appropriate yes. in, in the context in question. Oh, for sure. And may maybe, um, Jersey, maybe one last question. Now that we've gone through or going through COVID, do you see any benefits? Or what are the benefits from a circular aspect and how has COVID speeded up our move towards circularity? I mean, I know there's legislation coming down the road from a European aspect that will mandate this maybe in 18 months time, two years. But what, what, what are you seeing? I think the biggest, um, uh, you know, in terms of the impact of COVID is the recognition that global supply chains are vulnerable and that ultimately it's important to build in resilience through local sources of key materials. So I, yes. we will always be reliant on global supply chains, but the, I think the, what COVID has done is really highlight to businesses where there are fundamental risks in their supply chain that have crippled some businesses. Um, and that's where I think it's, it's hitting home the value of exploring different ways of setting up supply yes. and sourcing materials and collaborating. Yes, fantastic. That's fantastic, Geraldine. Thank you. So maybe one final question to Patrick before we want, before we finish up. Uh, we will finish up for five. So Patrick, just on that roadmap, and we've talked a lot about this, about this roadmap for Irish food, agri, ingredients business, because our theme here is food, food and um, agri. Um, so what do you think that the... Um, the roadmap is versus even the traditional farming agri practices? Yeah, so I think we, we will see elements of this emerging, uh, Mary, in the agri-food strategy, which will probably go to public consultation uh, over the next uh, short period, probably in this quarter this year. And in that, I suppose, we're trying to spell out the role that uh, the bioeconomy could play to help the agri-food sector. Uh, as, as Geraldine says, there's no silver bullet, but play its role appropriately with the right sustainability assessments to deliver some of the value, to deliver that some of the value chains will be, uh, have uh, deliver on sustainability, circularity, uh, and, and with the right climate profile. Uh, so th that, that's the idea. I, I think it, the policy statement that we've had at present um, didn't really pick out any sectors. Uh, it just tried to set up an enabling system. And as Peter has pointed out that there, there still are hurdles to jump over. Um, yes. But I suppose what, what, what we're kind of moving towards is if, if we can protect nature as a fundament of the agri-food system and the biological system, that the diversity and functionality that will be present in this agri-food system will really underpin a much more climate-friendly, valuable and healthy, first of all, soil, the farms, the land, and ultimately the food and forestry systems that follow on from there. Mm. And that's the road we need to travel. And what Ireland yeah, needs to do sure. is engage everyone that we can travel on this as quickly as we need to do. Now it's, and, and that's, that's where the, I suppose, the investment of Project Ireland 2040 and the European funds are needed because yes. this change is not, uh, is not without cost. So yeah, for sure. that's, that's, that's the road we're on, Mary. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And then the whole piece there is integration into Europe and that whole big picture piece too from a global aspect. So I want to thank you all. It was fantastic, really insightful. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, Patrick. Really great. Um, you know, we're, we're all learning on how to move this forward and how to create circularity. Um, but also thanks to my co-host, Kira, and to Joanne, um, and to Dublin City Council um, for sponsoring th these webinars and Michaela, who's done questions doing a great job there and to our tech company, uh, Web Journey and Digital Marketing. So we would like to remind you that it's uh, one of a four part series and next week is the future of food and bio-based systems where we talk about, uh, we have Nutramara, um, we have Green Generation and then we have, a, we have a regional hub and local versus global is a big part of this um, and how we're going to move forward. Um, so we have some useful resources that we've linked into Circular, have a great, uh, have a great knowledge hub um, and likewise have Patrick has created with the Irish Bioeconomy Foundation and Bowerbeck some, some great resources. So we've linked them in there um, through the Upthink. And if you have any questions, you can come back to me and we can um, pipe them back to our speakers. Uh, thank you. That has been a uh, super hour um, on the circular economy. And we look forward to seeing you next week at 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.